of the Gambia case against Myanmar for genocide against the Rohingya, of course, brought on behalf of the Islamic Conference of States. And this is important because it's, you know, it's not saying that Gambian nationals were in, in Myanmar. This is pushing the envelope and enforcing the rule of law, states taking leadership roles to ensure that horrific atrocities, that there is some accountability, where at the they, ICJ has issued provisional measures orders in a similar um, vein, we have Canada and the Netherlands bringing the case against Syria for torture under the Assad regime. And these two situations are particularly important because they're ones we don't otherwise have jurisdiction over. So um, in my as to Myanmar, um, they are not a state party to the ICC statute. So obviously crimes internal to Myanmar cannot be prosecuted at the ICC. And it's only those crimes that spill over into Bangladesh such as forced deportation that the ICC can pursue because it needs one element of the crime in a state party. Similarly, in the situation of Syria, um, we all know that uh, Russia and China vetoed referral to the ICC, so there's no ICC case, there's no Syria tribunal. Um, so these are situations that are, are difficult to deal with. Um, in both instances, we do have investigative mechanisms, the IIIM, Triple I and M in Geneva compiling evidence. And particularly for Syria, this has been able to feed into some domestic cases, but it is not accountability as a whole. So there is a long ways to go. We also have South Africa's case against Israel alleging genocide in the Gaza Strip. Um, so far, we have a provisional measures order, not the ruling on the merits. Um, and we have Ukraine suing Russia for a declaration that there was no genocide in the east of Ukraine. Um, and of course, that was used bogus arguments by Russia to justify the invasion. We also have advisory opinions at the ICJ, um, the one um, against uh, or regarding Israel, it is practices in the occupied Palestinian territories, and the advisory opinion on climate change, um, looking at greenhouse gas emissions and what um, that is going to do to future generations. So these are new important uses of the ICJ. Um, yet our system still has alarming gaps, and this is what we all need to work on. I'm going to save my remarks on the crime of aggression for the second round, um, tremendous gaps there. There are still crimes that are really eluding the, the reach of any of what I talked about. I say crimes against the Uyghurs in China. So we do not have a tribunal. We won't have referral to the ICC. Um, it is hard to imagine universal jurisdiction working in that context. And we have you know, many attempts to even silence discussion of these crimes. Um, so there, there's far too little attention. Um, a situation where um, it, it, it looks like all five of the underlying crimes of genocide are occurring. This is an unusual situation. Um, that we seem to have every single one of Ra what Raphael Lemkin was writing about. Um, so um, China is a party to the Genocide Convention, but they have the reservation against being sued. And you know, this is something I think in the future needs to be worked on. We have a decision um, a couple decades ago, five of the ICJ judges said we should not be having a reservation um, against suits for genocide, that this is undermining of the object and purpose, but it wasn't a majority, but they said the court should revisit this issue. I think the court should revisit this issue. Um, and uh, you, just to say, and the reason we try to get these crimes at, at the international level is there often are immunities that can attach at the domestic level. That's a very complicated area um, and the edges are being pushed and there is pushback against it. Um, so, um, and we also, you know, I talked about Myanmar and Syria, and let me just call out the blockage really is at the Security Council level. Um, Rebecca so kindly gave a shout out to my book, Existing Legal Limits to the Veto Power. So I'm here going beyond the French-Mexican Initiative Act Code of Conduct, <laughs> saying that there are um, legal obligations not to, for instance, aid genocide. Um, and we need to start looking at vetoes from this um, uh, the perspective of a system of international law, including use Kogan's, the, um, the obligations under the charter and obligations such as the obligation to prevent genocide. Um, this has never been done and, and we need to move this forward. 
So, um, and stay tuned, there will be an event at the International Peace Institute, a film on, on these ideas uh, launched on October 8th. Um, and of course, lastly, to acknowledge that in any of our situations, when we're dealing with mass atrocity crimes, there are going to be tremendous impunity gaps that mass atrocities need to be tackled at so many different levels. Um, in the former Yugoslavia a situation, you think, you know, a lot has been put in, but there's a tremendous backload of cases. They will never do all the prosecutions. Ukraine is now having to deal with thousands and thousands of cases. The ICC will play an important contribution. Um, Sudan, we seem to have a resurfacing of the genocide. It is continuing. Um, and we have, you know, one case at the ICC. It matters, but it, it is too little. And states need to work on getting Bashir to The Hague. Um, so unfortunately, um, Eastern Congo, the same, a few cases, mobile courts, but still tremendous impunity gaps. So to conclude, I think it's all about jurisdiction. We need jurisdiction at the ICJ. We need more universality of the Rome Statute, um, ratification of the amendments, because you can't do deterrence if you don't have jurisdiction. You can't do prosecutions without jurisdiction. So this is our challenge. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for summarizing the entire ecosystem <laughs> of international you. law so succinctly um, uh, and so beautifully. Um, as we are here um, at the summit of the future, uh, we have seen the ambitions um, of what was hailed uh, as a very aspirational process um, depleted and shallow, made more shallow over the course of the months that the uh, main documents have been debated. And every time I look at this process and every time I look at the outcomes, I think about how quixotic it might have seemed in 1998 to have the International Criminal Court come into being. And yet we've all experienced this in our lifetime, a seismic change um, in favor of accountability, the hope for all humanity, according to um, late Secretary General Kofi Annan. Um, and here today with us to discuss support for the court, both in terms of its universality beyond the 124, soon to be 125 member states, but also in terms of cooperation and complementarity is Matthias Hellman, who is currently acting head of outreach at the registry of the ICC, temporarily reassigned from his regular post as external relations advisor of the ICC presidency, a function that he assumed in July, 2010. Prior to joining the ICC, Matthias worked for 10 years at the International Court uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, of which eight were in the ICTY's field offices in Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, Matthias, it is such an honor to have you with us today. And may I say that I also had the privilege of serving with Matthias for a short time as visiting professional in uh, the presidency. And it was one of the greatest honors of, of my life or my, and my career. So Matthias, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, it's great to be with all of you and thank you for that uh, extremely kind in introduction. And uh, yeah, it was indeed wonderful to work with you as well um, here at the ICC a few years ago. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be part of this event. Before I continue, I must preface my remarks with the standard caveat that I will be speaking in in a personal capacity and any views I express are not attributable to the International Criminal Court. Now, if I had to choose one reason why the ICC deserves universal support, it would be deterrence. And this really, you know, uh, uh, ties in with what uh, Jennifer already said earlier. Uh, really for me, deterrence, the preventive effect of the IC is crucial. I remember being afraid of war when I was a little kid, despite the fact that I grew up in one of the world's safest countries, Finland. But the thought of the, you know, insecurity, killing, chaos, violence uh, that I imagined war would be, uh, it was it was terrifying for me. And uh, as I grew up, I learned that war is, wars are usually much more than just armies fighting each other. And... Uh, and, and when I did victim community outreach work in, in the countries of the former Yugoslavia, then I could really painfully witness firsthand the devastating effect that atrocity crimes have on 
societies, communities, and, and thousands, in fact, millions of individuals. I mean, the suffering is just, it's enormous. So for me, the human toll of wars and atrocities is so vast, it, so immense that I think humankind should do absolutely everything it can to prevent such uh, suffering. And I'm convinced that the IC is one of the essential tools uh, in this respect. It, it, it's not a matter of faith alone. There are many empirical studies which do indicate that over time, on average, membership in the ICC reduces the likelihood of conflicts and atrocities. Uh, to name at least one, for instance, Professor Jeff Dancy did some research which uh, indicated that ICC state parties were significantly less likely to become involved in new conflicts than non-members at the ICC. Uh, uh, professors Hiram Joe and Beth Simmons did another research where they uh, stated that ICC ratification reduces the rate of government-sponsored killings by nearly 50%. And there are other studies by uh, Catherine Seeking, James Mernick, uh, Courtney Hillebreth, Benjamin Apple. Of course, accountability is not a magic wand. Uh, murder is outlawed in every country of the world, yet people are still murdered. But accountability does matter. No matter what the criminal offenses, you want to put any potential perpetrators on notice that they should not count on impunity, that they cannot count on impunity. And where the ICC has jurisdiction to act, going again back to what Jennifer said, where we have jurisdiction, uh, the IC can be a real game changer in that respect. The IC may not be a guarantee of accountability, but it does make accountability a real prospect for anyone, anyone who might contemplate the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity or war crimes. Of course, the deterrent, deterrent effect of the IC depends on many factors. Uh, one is coverage, again, jurisdiction. That is to say the rate of ratification of the Rome Statute. Where does the IC actually have jurisdiction? Uh, we have 124 states parts at the moment. I'm optimistic that slowly but surely we will see that number increase. Uh, apart from deterrence and basically the protection of, of your population and territory, I think another reason why states sh should join the system is to be inside the ICC and take part in shaping the, the future of international criminal law. Apart from coverage, you also need commitment. So we need the state's parties uh, to support fully and, and to cooperate fully with the ICC in line with the Rome Statute. So the truth is, of course, we all know that support for the ICC is neither global nor unconditional at this point. To, and to achieve that, to, 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 to make progress toward such a point, we need continued, relentless, forceful, tireless advocacy. We need advocacy from states, we need advocacy from international civil society, national civil society, and the court also contributes to this. Although in principle, I think like a court should be a court. It shouldn't be the court of alone, but I think at this point, the court also does need to, if nothing else, at least to, to promote awareness and understanding of what it really is. To conclude, um, so ideally, in, in, I suppose in some remote day in the future, I, I would, I, you know, I have this vision where the ICC is like perceived the same way, in the same way as courts are perceived in, in an, any national system based on democracy and the rule of law. Basically, you may not always agree with the, the rulings of a court, but you don't question their necessity, you comply with their decisions, because without a credible system of adjudication and enforcement, legal norms risk being just words on paper with limited weight. And that applies to international law as well. Uh, let me leave it at that, and I look forward to conversation later. Thank you so much, Matthias. And I think that you, you also remind us 
that to keep the independence and integrity of the judicial branch of our global governance system, it cannot be forced to defend itself um, at every turn. And so some of us in this room may know, um, uh, and those of you who are US citizens especially may be aware, that the International Criminal Court and to an extent the International Court of Justice are under threat right now. And in fact, the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee next week will mark a bill that would put sanctions on the ICC um, and severely hinder and impair its ability to operate um, based on a um, uh, based on the judgment of uh, of Congress um, that certain situations are not things that it should be pursuing. Um, we when we look at the ICC and when we hear from Jennifer also the innovations of the International Court of Justice. The international uh, legal system is still an evolutionary process. And what we're gonna hear next is a little bit, and we, we talked about some of the gaps earlier, and we're gonna hear a little bit about the next phase, um, the next evolutionary leap, um, including efforts to um, enshrine a crimes against humanity treaty. And joining us to discuss this is uh, Keela Radhakrishnan. She's the C C strategic legal advisor for gender justice at the Atlantic Council's Str strategic litigation process. Uh, project, excuse me. She's an international human rights lawyer and a globally recognized expert in justice and accountability, sexual and gender based violence, gender equality, and reproductive rights. And she previously served as the president and legal director of the Global Justice Center. And so I hope, Akila, you can also focus your remarks, I know that you will, um, on gender justice before the international courts and tribunals. Thank you so much, Akila. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thank you to OSGI for hosting us, and it's really um, great to be a part of this event. So I will try to be brief on this, um, but as it's kind of been alluded to, there is one gap in the international legal architecture that there is a process right now that it's seeking to address, right? After World War II, we got the Genocide Convention, we got an update to the Geneva Conventions, and we had prosecutions at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity, but to date, you know, 70 years later, we don't have a standalone treaty on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. So there's an ongoing process right now at the UN Legal Committee, the Sixth Committee, to actually try to move forward to negotiations on such a treaty, um, and potentially maybe even in the next uh, two months, a decision might be made to do so. And so, you know, just to kind of outline, right, the, the gap in the international legal architecture is in the treaty is not just about the prosecution side of it, which is often what we focus on, right? It does create more universalization around the definition of crimes against humanity. It strengthens the basis for a universal jurisdiction because it is a treaty, it is a domestication treaty, it is a treaty about what countries should do um, in their own, um, you know, in their own territories, but it also includes state responsibility. So it actually includes explicit duties to prevent, punish, and suppress crimes against humanity. So we're not just dealing with what it means to drag an individual into court, but to really look at what is the architecture that actually enables crimes against humanity to happen and how you can hold them to account. And um, Jen was talking about also getting more jurisdiction at the ICJ. Well, the, the, the treaty does actually include dispute resolution at the ICJ for crimes against humanity. And I think one of the things about that that's really important is that, you know, we often get into these fights about is something a genocide? And oftentimes that has to do with whether or not we can get it into certain venues that are available under the Genocide Convention. You know, I think we all know that the definition of crimes against humanity, while specific, does cover a much broader set of circumstances. And so having dispute resolution for crimes against humanity can also open up, I think, the opportunities to really think about some of these situations where you've identified very you know, serious gaps in country specific situations. And so crimes against humanity do, do cover that wider breadth. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the process that's ongoing right now is there is a cross regional effort that is being led by Mexico and the Gambia. Mexico's here in the room. We're very grateful to them for their leadership on this process um, to actually say that over the last two years, there have been, um, there's been a two year process of dedicated sessions looking at the draft articles that the International Law Commission put together to see whether or not those form an appropriate basis for negotiations. And there's been really robust engagement at the Sixth Committee on these topics. And now the question is, is has that consideration moved us sufficiently forward to a place to say that we are now at a place where we can negotiate a treaty? I think that, you know, there are, of course, those who oppose it, but the general consensus seems to be that folks do feel that, in fact, such a consensus exists to at least move forward to negotiations, not necessarily 
that consensus exists on many of the issues that are in the treaty, which many of which are actually quite sticky, right? But the idea is that you can't actually resolve them by just having debates in a circle at the UN General Assembly and that it's actually negotiations where states can, you know, actually hash out what they think their positions will be and, and what the legal obligations are. And so right now, um, they, uh, there has been a resolution that has been tabled by Mexico and the Gambia with a pretty robust set of co-sponsors already. And they're, you know, the, the process now over the next two months as the six committee moves into its work will be to negotiate that resolution and hopefully come to a conclusion on whether or not it's appropriate to move to negotiations. Um, in my second intervention, I'll get a little bit more into some of the specifics on gender. But I do think that's the other important piece around the treaty is that it's something that looks to the future, right? We can look at what have we missed? I know Jocelyn's going to talk a little bit about some of this. What are some of the gaps substantively in the legal architecture? What are some of the oversights? How can this process actually help us update the concepts of justice and particularly to me, concepts of gender justice? Like think about what it is that we understand about gender now. What are our new learnings and how do we incorporate that into something? Because right now, um, I'll just preview for my next intervention. The draft articles are largely based on the Rome Statute. In the last 25 years, we've learned a lot, particularly about issues of gender. And so what were compromises that were made at Rome that perhaps aren't serving the issues of gender justice? What are gaps and oversights that happen? And how is it that this process can perhaps help us redress what some of those gaps are? So I think that's some of the, the thinking and the momentum behind it, but feeling hopeful that this is something that can come out of this present uh, General Assembly session. Thank you so much, Akila. Um, and uh, I think we'd be remiss to say that, uh, not to mention that um, we were honored when um, a now sitting uh, judge of the ICJ helped us launch the Law Not Work campaign almost a year ago now, um, uh, Judge um, Gomez Robledo Verduzco. Um, and so we are really um, um, honored by the support of Mexico um, in terms of the universality of the ICJ, as well as on this, the leadership on the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, as well as on the leadership on uh, limits to the veto power. The France-Mexico resolution, I think, was mentioned um, um, uh, uh, obliquely in Jennifer's opening remarks. Uh, when it comes to the universality of the ICJ, Akila mentioned that the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty includes the ICJ as the method of dispute resolution. A uh, compromissary clause such as that is, of course, one way that a case can reach the ICJ currently. Um, and uh, Jennifer also mentioned a couple of the um, innovative recent uh, findings of standing, like Gambia v. Myanmar, um, where it was uh, the fact that a small West African state with the support of the Islamic Organization of States um, could bring a claim of genocide uh, against a country halfway around the world um, was found to be valid. And also, um, I think it bears mentioning perhaps that Myanmar also um, had um, a disputed standing on the basis of the Islamic Organization of State support. And that was also found to be invalid and, and that the case could proceed before the court. Um, so we're next going to hear um, from uh, Jocelyn Getchkin, uh, Getchen, sorry, Keston Baum every time, um, <laughs> who's a professor of law <laughs> at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law, where she directs the Ben Perens Human Rights and Atrocity Prevention Clinic in the Cardozo Law Institute in Holocaust and Human Rights Study. Her scholarship focuses on human rights, public health, and atrocity prevention, um, especially related to pre uh, preventing and re responding to sexual and gender-based crimes, slavery, the slave trade, genocide, indigenous rights, and human, human rights violations against other minority groups. And Jocelyn, I, I hope that you'll share with us a little bit um, about what uh, both the, the how the Rome Statute could be expanded, how other um, uh, efforts such as the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty uh, Initiative um, can address some of these lacunae in international law and ongoing atrocities. Thank you, sure. Jocelyn. Thank you. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you to OSDI and um, everyone for being here in attendance. Um, I think Akila and uh, Jennifer teed it up very well for the comments that I was planning to uh, to intervene with today. So one of the thoughts that I've been having is about expanding jurisdiction and thinking about the Crimes Against Humanity draft treaty as a real opportunity to focus also on prevention of mass atrocity crimes, as been said. And one of the things that we must do in terms of thinking about the future 
is also excavate the past. It's incredibly important for us to be looking uh, at what maybe didn't make it to some of our most recent iterations of international law treaties and institutions that are purported to protect all of us. And one of the things that is missing in action is the crime of the slave trade. Um, I would say that the slave trade and the abolition of the slave trade actually made a lot of contributions to the international legal architecture in that some of the first international tribunals were the mixed commissions that were set up by treaty uh, to intervene, uh, detain uh, those who were transporting slaves across the Atlantic. And while some might argue that those are the first human rights courts, I somewhat think that the right to property was probably the right that was most uh, uh, protected mm -hmm. during those courts. But it was the first time that we saw intervention and rule of law through the abolition of the slave trade. And the courts at Sierra Leone were some of the most active courts intervening in over 500 different cases at that time. And to, so today, I, I, the slave trade, something that I'm studying is one of the oldest international crimes uh, and also prohibitions under international law. But it is, as I said, missing in action. It's not found in the Rome Statute. It's not found in the draft Crimes Against Humanity Treaty for the reasons that Akila mentioned, that it was imperative to those who were drafting the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty to whole, in whole part, cut and paste the Crimes Against Humanity enumerated list of crimes from the Rome Statute to the draft treaty. So that is concerning and that's concerning because the slave trade is a prohibition under international law that's customary law, and it is a crime against humanity. It is erga omnes, it, it is use kogans, all of the, the words that we use in international law to describe a super normative status under international law, under no circumstances can one act of the slave trade happen in any country, anywhere. It triggers the idea of universal jurisdiction, that any state anywhere can bring uh, to, to bear a violation of this uh, particular prohibition. And it incurs state responsibility as a non-derivable human right. It's found in the 1926 and 1956 slavery conventions. That's the first time we have a definition of the slave trade. And I will just give you a quick definition so that you understand what I'm talking about. The slave trade is generally bringing a person into a situation of slavery or enslavement or acquiring or disposing an enslaved person. So it can be bringing someone into a situation of enslavement or moving some, someone who is enslaved from one situation to another situation or disposing a person who is enslaved. And the slave trade and therefore outlaws the abduction, kidnapping, transfer, gifting, exchanging of persons. And right now under the jurisdiction of the Rome Statute, those individuals cannot be brought before the ICC directly unless they are also, in addition to slave trading, engaging in the crime of enslavement as well. So in April, 2023, Sierra Leone did submit a proposal to include the slave trade as an enumerated provision in the draft articles on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. And this is a really big step forward. What I would say, not just to expand the jurisdiction, but to rectify, I think, the jurisdiction of both the Rome Statute and this future crimes against humanity draft treaty, because under international law, the slave trade is already a prohibition and a crime and should be included in all of these. You remain with us online and a special thank you to our wonderful host at OSJI <laughs> and the inimitable round of applause for our tech team here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're, we're going to go now to a second round of interventions from our panelists. Um, but while we do so, um, those of you who are online, um, please uh, think about your questions. The, you see the Q&A function is live. Um, get those in there. We'll be coming to you. And of course, um, get your hands ready for those in, in the room. Um, as we'll go into discussion uh, shortly. 
Um, so I'm going to begin by um, asking a question of a pair of our panelists, Jocelyn and, and Matthias, maybe starting with Matthias, as we just heard from Jocelyn. Um, the international courts and tribunals can also often seem very remote, far away, based in The Hague in some instances um, or elsewhere. Um, and yet, I think uh, there is an underappreciated connection um, to victim-centered justice that is happening that we don't always see before the international courts and tribunals. And we see this in a number of ways. Um, and I think um, maybe Matthias can speak to some of the innovations at the International Criminal Court, including the Trust Fund for Victims, and then uh, Jocelyn in terms of reparations and other ways in which we involve victims um, as participants, active participants in judicial processes. So Matthias, if you wouldn't mind, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Is the sound okay at that end, you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I just briefly want to highlight what I see as a, as a huge evolution in international criminal justice. Having worked myself at the, the ISTY, the Yugoslav Tribunal, for many years, you know, I, I saw there, first of all, outreach, the, like the active uh, dissemination of information to the affected communities was a bit of an afterthought. It was never part of the tribunal's regular budget. It was an sort of an extra budgetary trust fund project sort of that was added a bit later. It did uh, uh, come to life and it was very important, but uh, that, that already says something. Uh, and of course, at the ICTY, there was no participation of victims. There were no reparations to victims. And today we have all these elements in the, in the ICC uh, and and I'm not sure if, you know, uh, it's always appreciated how extensive that effort is, which the ICC puts into uh, uh, making its justice system meaningful for, for victims. Outreach, where I'm now working, that's, that's only one part of it. By outreach, we mean the two-way communication with the affected communities, basically going actively to the communities, using the, the languages that are spoken there, to give information about what is happening at the IC, what it is, listening to views, questions, concerns, trying to answer them, kind of maintaining that flow of information in, in two directions. But uh, also the IC has this entire system for the participation of victims in the proceedings. We have uh, an entire section called the Victim Participation Reparations Section, whose job is to facilitate those applications from thousands upon thousands of victims to be formally part of the proceedings and to apply for reparations. We have uh, an office for the, uh, of the Public Council for Victims with lawyers who represent victims in the proceedings in the courtroom. We have legal representatives of victims paid by a uh, legal aid system of the court who can also represent the, the interest of victims in the proceedings. They're not a, a party in the same way that the prosecution and defense are, they are participants in the proceedings. So they don't have the same full rights as the parties do, but they can very actively take part in the proceedings and even, uh, even propose evidence to be uh, presented in the court. They can question witnesses, uh, witnesses under the control of the chamber and, and so forth. And then there's reparations. We have recently had a couple of cases, uh, the Daganda case concerning uh, widespread crimes in the Ituri province in Northern Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the chamber uh, ordered reparations in the amount of 30 million US dollars to what is estimated to be a victim population, about 10,000 victims. We have the Ongwen case now, uh, concerning crimes in northern Uganda uh, of the Lord's Resistance Army, where the amount ordered by the judges is even higher, uh, about 50, 58 million US dollars to a population of what is estimated at this point to be about 50,000 victims. But now we are facing a huge process of finding the, the victims, basically informing the population where the, the potential victims are then taking applications, determining the eligibility of the victims for the reparations, and then implementing the reparations. And that's where the trust fund for victims comes in, 
which is sort of attached to the ICC, the trust fund which collects the donations from states and other donors, and then basically comes in when the convicted person doesn't have the means, the funds, the resources to actually make the reparations possible. So the trust fund can use the donations to what we say complement the reparations award, basically use the collected funds to make sure that there, is, there are reparations despite the indigence of the convicted person. And again, we're now talking about like tens of thousands of victims. So the mere person of identifying the victims, let alone then implementing the reparations, this will take years and this is a massive undertaking. So beyond kind of the criminal trial in the courtroom where you are deciding on guilt and innocence and, and punishment, there's an entire other aspect of what the IC is doing, which is really focused on delivering tangible justice to victims. So I, I want to highlight this as something that I see as being hugely, hugely important and a massive step in international criminal justice. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And, and I think one of the underappreciated um, uh, benefits of both the ICC and the ICJ is something that we call reverse complementarity as well, where states domesticate, the, in the case of the ICC, the core crimes in the Rome Statute um, that hopefully we're going to be elaborating on how those uh, can, can expand um, and grow. Um, and then, um, uh, therefore, uh, domestic legal ju um, uh, justice and pathways um, are improved. Um, Jocelyn, would you also like to take this question a little bit more about a victim-centered approach and how we can bring things closer to the affected communities and individuals? Sure. So I'll just build off of what Matthias was just talking about to say that there are real concrete cases right now that have just gone through the uh, ICC. And one of them is the Ong Wen case, which recently uh, the appeals chamber reached a decision that Ong Wen was responsible for enslavement. There were facts in that case of the slave trade and those facts could not be legally characterized. And those of the victims who, engage, uh, who were victimized through in the slave trade were not able to seek all of that justice at the ICC. They cannot be characterized as victims. They might have experienced other crimes, but if that was the crime, right now it's not cognizable under the Rome Statute and therefore the victim survivors don't have an avenue for this very important material redress today. And that is what we're talking about. And then Rebecca is talking about the ways in which Everyone looks to the Rome Statute, looks to the ICC in their domestic jurisdictions to expand or to improve or to think about if, at the evolution of justice it, at the domestic levels. If the crimes aren't in the Rome Statute, they don't come to the domestic level. They aren't implemented there and reparations is not available then at the domestic level. So you can see the importance of needing to rectify uh, an instrument like the Rome Statute, both for the future of the Crimes Against Humanity draft treaty and for the domestic legal jurisdictions, and even for the present victim survivors of slavery and slave trade crimes today that are not able to access reparations. And I would also suggest, and Patty Sellers, who's the uh, special advisor to the ICC's Office of the Prosecutor on Slavery Crimes, she and I are writing about the idea as well that legal reform efforts to include the slave trade can really be a form of reparations for past slavery perpetration and slave trade perpetration specifically. So states who are member states of the ICC who maybe have been complicit in past slave trades engaging in this process to rectify the Rome Statute and to have that crime also enumerated in the future Crimes Against Humanity draft treaty is in itself a form of reparative justice because we now then have a tool in the accountability tool belt to ensure that victim survivors do receive reparations and can bring their cases before these courts. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And um, as we think about ways that we can update, upgrade, um, improve, expand this toolbox, 
I mentioned in my opening remarks that the crime of aggression was left on the cutting room floor with uh, the current version of the Pact for the Future. Um, I think maybe, Jennifer, you can talk a little bit about the crime of aggression, the nuances of jurisdiction, and then we'll come back to Akila as well for the ways in which gender justice still stands to be improved within the international judicial architecture. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so it is inexplicable that we would leave off one of the Rome statutes for crimes. Um, this is not in any way, the crime of aggression is not really an update, unlike our, our other um, areas we're discussing. It's a very old crime. It's from the Nuremberg Tribunal. Um, and it's all about enforcing the UN Charter. And I think the horrors of what has happened to the people of Ukraine has maybe newly refocused our attention on what they called in the Nuremberg judgment, the supreme international crime. Why? Because it sets off all the other crimes. So if you didn't have the aggression, you would not reach all of the other horrors that have been inflicted on the people of Ukraine. And even all the diligent attempts one could make, one domestic authorities in the ICC will never be able to prosecute all of the crimes. Um, and the crime of aggression is also fundamentally different because I think that soldiers on both sides are victims of the crime of aggression as well. They should not be forced to die in an illegal war, but under the laws of war, they can be targeted, they can be killed. There is no war crime. So it is fundamental. Um, so having the gaps pre-existed, but maybe it's the invasion uh, that has refocused us. Um, and this is a crime that doesn't only impact regarding Russia and Ukraine. This is really a threat to the international world order. It's a threat to all states. Um, so in the Ukraine situation, two parallel initiatives have resulted, and one is to try to create a special tribunal on the crime of aggression for the situation of Ukraine, and the other is to fix the Rome statute going forward that we don't have such limited jurisdiction. Um, the special tribunal was thought we do this one off because it's it's unclear how when we get the Rome statute fixed, would it cover this situation? But I have to say it's been a disheartening process to participate in as the states leading, pushing for an international tribunal, which would set the strongest global precedent. If you want to someday deter China, you need strong precedent. Um, and this push led by Liechtenstein, Ukraine, Poland, other states was undermined by the G7 states that said, no, no, we don't need a Ukrainian, uh, we, we could just use a Ukrainian chamber. Well, no, you can't just use. There were immunities issues. A Ukrainian chamber was set nowhere near the precedent. Um, anyway, th those talks, unfortunately, the, they were able to defeat the idea of an international tribunal talks in a core group of states, whether there will be a Council of Europe Ukrainian tribunal, um, more of a European approach with other countries able to join, but disappointingly still on the negotiation table is immunities. So uh, please ask G7 states why they're pushing for Putin to be immune. It is unacceptable. It is completely unacceptable. They also don't want to use the Rome statute definition of the crime. They'd like us jurisprudentially to go back to 1945. And this should be a problem for all Rome statute state parties. So that's where that stands. But more broadly, we do need to turn back to the Rome statute. You probably all know that uh, for the supreme crime, we have a really sliver of jurisdiction. And this was a result of political compromises made in 2010, 2017. Um, and there really is no um, legally coherent reason. It was all political. Germany is leading the approach of the amendment. If you're represent a state and you're listening, um, please reach out to Germany. Um, if you don't have the contacts, reach out to Liechtenstein. Um, <laughs> and, and because there are just two paragraphs in the definition of 15 bis that could be removed and we would take the crime of aggression back to the Article 12 jurisdictional regime that we have genocide for genocide war crimes, crimes against humanity. As it is currently crimes by non-state parties and on the territory of non-state parties are completely out of the jurisdictional regime. So this is what has exempted Russian nationals and would exempt the nationals of any non-state party. That's not how the other crimes work. 
because if the nationals of a non-state party commit the crime in the territory of a state party, there is jurisdiction, just as there is jurisdiction in Ukraine over genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, but not the crime of aggression. So you could delete 15 bis 5, 15 bis 4 is also the opt-out for states parties. And we think the better drafting regime would be just to spell out that 12 applies. So I have a proposed draft text that I'm also convener of the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression, started by Don and Ben Ferenz. And we have a draft text proposal that you can find um, on the corner. And I think it'll be put on a link. Um, and it would um, specify, um, get rid of this loophole. Um, this will come up. The, uh, conference on this is slated for next year. So in the Kampala resolution, um, there was a requirement seven years after activation to have a review. So activation was 2018, at seven we're at 2025. So this will be up next year. So we're actually a little bit late in the game in pushing on this um, and it really is critical. It's a very important endeavor. Um, it is basically enforcing the UN charter and when you have certain states just carved above the rule of law, this is antithetical to what we're all trying to achieve. There is no reason we should have this exceptionalism and two tiers of accountability built into the Rome statute. It's a difficult endeavor. Um, it's an, an endeavor that powerful states will not like. So we basically need all the states that stand for the rule of law and against exceptionalism to unite in trying to fix the Rome Statute and amend the Kampala Amendments. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jennifer. My colleagues have indeed put the links in the chat to the proposal to amend uh, the amendments to the crime of aggression, as well as to a link to the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression. For those of you in the room, Jennifer has kindly brought along hard copies that you can um, uh, peruse for yourselves. Um, Akila, and uh, over to you, if you'd like to go a little bit deeper on gender persecution, gender crimes, um, gender apartheid included um, before international courts and tribunals. Thanks, Rebecca. So, you know, I think as we're thinking about these conversations on the need to update and, you know, ensure that the law is actually responsive to the situations on the ground. I think, you know, we're in the midst of a feminist project that's been led by feminist lawyers, by survivors, to really better document, understand, hold accountable, and redress gender-based harm. And we've come a long way, but we also still have a long way to go. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of different things, including the ICC, the ICJ, as well as the treaty. So to start with the treaty, Right. As I mentioned, it was replicated from the Rome Statute. I also want to note that there were no women on the ILC until the year 2001. So when we talk about sometimes these baseline documents of international law, right, what was the baseline for the Rome Statute? What was the baseline that was being produced by the International Law Commission? There were no women on there altogether until 2001. And now we have a record number, but the number is still incredibly low. So it's also important to think about what expertise has often been brought to the table as we think about the foundations of international law, right? So I think that's something that I always think about when it comes to the treaty, because some people have said that, that those of us who are working on the gender strategy are being really aggressive. Um, and, you know, these things weren't in the foundational documents. I'm like, how are they ever going to be in the foundational documents? There was no one with any type of experience or expertise sitting at the table on these issues. And so, you know, as it relates to Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, I kind of will group um, the ideas on the table on gender. And, and these are some of the initial ideas under a couple of different buckets, right? One is to fix something that was perhaps not correct. So in, the, in that context, I put the definition of gender that was put into the Rome Statute, which many view as a compromise that really put in place a potentially limited binary definition of gender into the Rome Statute. And now the, you know, the OTP has done really great work through policies to interpret that much more inclusively, but that definition was actually dropped by the ILC from the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty to reflect the fact that perhaps it doesn't reflect the current status of the law as we understand gender. Um, and so, so that, what, to me, is like under this category of fix maybe what was not quite right in Rome, right? There are gaps. So what Jocelyn's been talking about around the slave trade. So the idea that there were things that were dropped off or missed that actually exist in the law 
that did not make it into the treaty. So how do we make sure that we address those gaps? And not, you know, another bucket is really to think about how it is that we codify the current status of jurisprudence. What have we learned? What have courts found, not just the ICC or the ICTY, but also domestic courts in places like Colombia that have done immense work to actually redress and understand gendered harms, right? So in that bucket, we have, for example, a proposal to codify the crime of forced marriage, which you know has been prosecuted with the special court for Sierra Leone. It's been found at the ICC, but it's actually not specifically enumerated in the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty, or to expand notions of reproductive violence. Um, you know, we have some limited hints towards reproductive violence, a definition of forced pregnancy if, from the Rome Statute that's been copied over that include some limitations and regressions around, for example, national laws relating to pregnancy that are very unnecessary to have in the definition of an international crime, but also to think more broadly about what are concepts of reproductive violence we've learned from some of the situations. So in Colombia, they've had cases that have looked at forced contraception, forced abortion, and how is it that we can maybe capture some of those within the treaty? Because it's not just about sexualized harm, which is often what we focus on, but gender-based harm is a much broader category and reproductive manipulation and violence is definitely an area, I think, where we're seeing more growth. Um, and then another piece is new phenomena. What are we seeing? You know, the law is often responsive to facts or situations on the ground. And in that bucket, I put the work on gender apartheid, where we're really looking at the situation in Afghanistan, where the entire system logic of governance is based on patriarchy, misogyny, right? What they've done is they have entirely erased women from society through a system of loss policies and practices. And we don't really have a crime that captures that systemic aspect of it. We have a crime that perhaps captures some of the underlying acts. Um, and so how is it that perhaps this is an opportunity to recognize what this new phenomenon is and to codify it, to create accountability, to create deterrence in the future? So, you know, on the treaty process, I think it's really important that we approach it with an open mind and say that, you know, while it's useful to have Rome as a baseline. It's really important to think about how to update this. And I will say that during the ongoing six committee discussions, we've actually seen very good support, cross-cutting support across the gendered issues. You know, the first, you know, oftentimes when you talk about gender, people are like, we're in a situation of backlash, we can't push forward, we have to just try to maintain what we can. But what we've actually seen is that states are quite supportive of pushing many of these ideas forward. And I think that we need to continue on that baseline that there is an imperative to continue to expand our concepts of gender justice and that we shouldn't just be in a place when we walk into any negotiation of the UN, frankly, not just on the treaty, that all we can manage now is to hold the line and to not lose protections, right? Because that has really held back and I think limited progress on gender justice over the last 10 years in particular. Um, in terms of the ICC, we've seen, um, you know, really great policies come out of the Office of the Prosecutor. They're really helping to systematize concepts of gender justice at the court. So we've seen an updated policy on sexual and gender-based crimes that, you know, built on the first policy in 2014. We saw a recent policy on the crime of gender persecution. Um, and uh, Jocelyn mentioned Patricia Sellers, who's now working on a new policy on slavery crimes that I think is going to be launched at this upcoming ASP, right? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> so really, again, ways to think about how it is that the OTP can better, you know, institutionalize some of these concepts throughout their, you know, from the conception of an investigation onwards to make sure that prosecutions for gender are more comprehensive. And, you know, the court still has a mixed record, right? Jocelyn mentioned the Ongwen case where we saw a very comprehensive set of sexual gender-based crimes be prosecuted and, and held up on appeal. But we also saw in the recent Al Hassan case that none of the gender crimes were actually convicted, right? Gender persecution kind of ended up in a weird loophole of, yes, they found it, but then, you know, they didn't find criminal culpability for it because of the way that duress was understood. And so we still have a long way to go in terms of the guarantees of gender justice in their places. And that includes, for example, thinking about how judges understand gender crimes and the fact that there may still be quite a bit of weight to go in that area. Um, and then I'll just conclude by talking about the ICJ since that's been a, a, a place that we've been discussing a lot, right? And I think that, you know, when I look at the different things at the ICJ, the first thing is there's no situation that we're looking at that is not gendered. There is a way to examine every single case and situation through a gendered angle. 
And so there are interesting ways that gender is being brought into these cases. So in the Gambia versus Myanmar case, there's a joint declaration that was filed and led by Canada. Um, and in that, they're actually trying to recast the law of genocide in a gendered manner. So that, that declaration or that intervention actually looks at and argues for how crimes of sexual and gender-based violence can be used to understand genocidal intent, including particularly the drop off aspect of genocidal intent, which is biological destruction and destruction of regenerative capacity, because the law on genocide has overly focused on physical destruction and killing. And so really thinking about how it's not just about understanding, for example, rape as an act of genocide, but the fact that a group of sexual and gender-based crimes can actually help provide the addition of genocidal intent itself. Um, in the Palestine case, uh, you know, proof that sometimes putting women and particularly feminists on courts matters, Hillary Charlesworth, in her separate opinion, actually unpacked the gendered impact of the occupation. So she talked about not, you know, and, and I think that was really important because we don't see this from a court like the ICJ. They're not gender experts, right? And so in her separate opinion, she actually looked at and talked about how some of the policies have a disproportionate impact on women. What does it mean to have policies that restrict rights that, for example, have an impact on women and forcing them to stay in abusive households because they don't have independent access to legal rights, right? And I think exposing the, cat, the facts as they are gendered is a really important way that the ICJ process can better actually include gendered experiences. And the last thing I will say, and um, you know, our hosts, uh, OSJ, have been doing amazing work, but they've put out a fact sheet on how the fact of women's rights violations could, and maybe this is radical, be itself a basis for going to the ICJ. And so looking at the situation in Afghanistan, they put out a really good Q&A that looks at how uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women can actually be a baseline to go to the court as it relates to the situation in Afghanistan. And yeah, I think we're all hopeful to see that perhaps some progress will be made on that. And so really there are so many different ways that we can be looking at how to bring gender into the conversation. And I don't think that we should feel satisfied with saying, oh, we have this one thing now, the project is done, right? And, and that's often the pushback you get is why do you have, why are you always asking for more? Um, and that question oddly doesn't come up when you're not talking about gender and you're talking about other issues. <laughs> um, but I will stop there. But I do think that the potential is there and it's really amazing to work with so many feminists on these accomplishments. And uh, thank you for also highlighting uh, the innovation, uh, maybe too strong word, but uh, certainly the, the major step taken forward with the latest opinion from Hillary Charlesworth. That was, that was notable and I commend to everybody, maybe my colleagues will be able to find it and put it in the chat. Um, what it says about gender. Um, we're gonna open up the discussion now to make a sense of uh, if there's anyone in the room who has a hand, okay, a couple. Um, I'm going to start with one from the chat and then I'll take two um, from the room. Um, so I'm going to bundle a couple from the chat and this is the perennial question that we get about compliance um, and uh, how do you compel states uh, to fulfill their obligations if they are a member state, if they are a state party to, to the ICC um, to execute arrest warrants. I think the example was given of Omar al-Bashir. History is, of course, repeating itself with Vladimir Putin. Um, I think we could also expand this to include cooperation with non-states parties um, with regards to the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice um, in terms of uh, compliance with its um, decisions, where um, studies, uh, Matthias quoted several for the ICC, uh, companion studies for the ICJ also find that the vast majority of its decisions are implemented um, in whole um, or uh, to, to a large extent. Um, so, Matthias, would you like to start out with that question about compliance um, and cooperation by member and non-member states? Uh, I don't want to go to that very much uh, right now, um, but I mean, I already <laughs> said that it's, it's, it's critical. I mean, well, maybe just to say, but I think most of you know that the court depends very much on, on cooperation of states not just for the arrest of suspects, but uh, for actually for all stages of investigations and trials, because basically the court's investigators staff cannot really enter the territories of any, any country without that country's agreement to do any, any actual work for the court. So access to witnesses, access to evidence, the transport of, of, of people, uh, uh, 
it, it all depends. It's all dependent on the cooperation of states. And that cooperation should be forthcoming, of course, at, at all times. But I, I leave it at, at that for now. I may have some other comments that I want to come back later very quickly if there is time. Uh, thank you, Matthias. And I'll just note that while we have some questions in the chat, we're not going to be going into individual um, situations or, or ongoing cases um, in their specificity. Um, I think what you're seeing here um, among our panelists, however, uh, gestures to the ongoing um, uh, atrocities and other issues of global concern that we're experiencing worldwide. I think Jennifer also is going to come in on the issue of compliance yeah, and cooperation. Just very quickly to add to what Matthias said, um, and as he, he well knows, um, it, arrests don't just happen. So if we go back to the former Yugoslavia, there was conditionality put on countries in the region. First, U.S. aid depended on arrests being effectuated. And then the EU put in com um, compliance with the ICTY as a condition for um, process in the accession process. I go back to this because arrests countries need to work on the issue of arrest. They don't just occur. Uh, pressure needs to be put on countries to make arrests. Um, and if, if there isn't a campaign to arrest Bashir and countries putting leverage, these things don't just happen. And we've recently seen Putin travel to Mongolia. Well, this needs to have some ramifications at the upcoming ASP or the ICC. Um, it, at the ICC, because we do have the example of the Jordan case that um, of President, then President Bashir going to Jordan, and there were proceedings. Um, well, now we have another situation of non-compliance. We don't want to go back to the time period when someone under arrest can just freely travel. We had this regarding Bashir. Um, and we don't want to have a repeat. So it's really important that there be some consequences and states, parties realize that they have an absolute obligation under the Rome statute to effectuate arrests. Thank you. So now we'll take a couple of live questions. I'll go one, two, three. Um, and if you could kindly introduce yourself, Kirk. Sure, I'm Kirk Boyd. And uh, I'm, I think, Rebecca, for putting together this uh, meeting on it national judicial architecture. I think it's a great topic right now with the faculty of the future. And uh, I work with uh, the legal faculty of the future, which has been putting together, as you're doing here, trying to orchestrate what, what would it look if we had an overarching system to enforce rights. And so when Jennifer said alarming gaps, I think that there is an alarming gap that's worthy of our attention that I want to ask. And that's it was with respect to the regional court systems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when you look after World War II, there was a real intent that there would be this expansion of these regional court systems. And we know that the European court has got some flaws, but it, it's, it's worked in large extent. Also, I practice, and I just had a case in, in Poland where I'm using the European law there, and it works. It really, when when Rene Kassan uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on the Universal Declaration and then serving as a judge in the European court, it was that nexus. And yet here, as back to the future, and I've been participating in this for the last year and a half, there's no discussion of the regional courts. As you know, Rebecca, you and I have talked about this. And so I would think that this is one of the glaring gaps, Jennifer, and, and that uh, it is, and there's an attempt to deal with this in the People's Pact for the Future document. Uh, the regional courts are included in there, but then when you look at the actual Act for the future, as you've mentioned, they're not existent there and have been discussed. So I, I think it's worthy of discussion. And then I would point out that there's an organization called Eleanor Lives that Missy and I have been working on for many years. Um, it's an extension of this intent to have these regional courts. If you all look on your table, there's a booklet like this, this um, International Bill of Rights. And I'm not going to start telling you the story. The booklet tells the story. But if you'll take a look at the booklet, uh, it really does show the merit now of uh, having this expansion of the regional court systems. And the last thing I'll say is that um, there's also a video. When you look in the booklet and you go to the website, there's a video there that uh, it's just three minutes. So it's not a lot of your time, but it will 
show you this whole backstory of how do we expand these regional courts. And it's, it's a beautiful thing when you start seeing the regional courthouses that are actually in the way now. Um, and so that's it. I'm, Thank I'm, you I'm so much. We can add I hope, one of yeah, the and, I, and I think um, hopefully we can also add that into the chat as well. Some of those links that you mentioned, including, in, including the video. And we also recently had an event um, just a few weeks ago um, where we were looking at innovations in environmental justice and there in the inter-American system has really been path-breaking in a way that we have not necessarily seen. We hope that the advisory opinion forthcoming from the ICJ, um, uh, of course, will deliver some, um, uh, some good news on the obligations of states with regards to climate change, but taking from the inter-American system. My dear friend, that you had your hand up too. Yes, I did. I think Jennifer Wright, by the way, Emma Osong, uh, with advocacy that worked for Justice and Peace, formerly Women for Permanent Peace and Justice. I'm probably the only lawyer in here. So I think you began answering some of the, um, uh, the giving some answers to the questions that I had. So what I wanted to find out uh, from the participants and the centers is resources notwithstanding, right? And here we're talking about the courts. How will the Pact for the Future address some of the shortcomings that are really that has bubbled up around this issue of uh, double standards, right? Um, because it's real and well. Uh, where Jennifer talked about Ukraine, the, again, not going into specific crises around the world because there are no shortage of prices. How how would the Pact of the Future address some of these glaring, obvious? cases of double standards. Are, are there provisions there to deal with uh, the courts, within the courts when they don't intervene in a timely manner or when it's clear that they actually should use those paradigm seats approach that you mentioned and they fail to do so? Thank you so much, Emma. Um, I'll give your panel an opportunity to contemplate those two questions on regional courts and tribunals and what the Pact of the Future does or should be doing um, to address the international judicial architecture. Then I'll go to Anna in the room and try to get to a couple more in the chat. Um, would any of our panelists like to start out with either of those first two questions? Maybe some in the room since Matias was put on the spot last time. I mean, I'll just say with regard to the regional court systems, I would say they're very active. And in fact, the inter-American system has been extremely innovative in not only its climate justice work, but in indigenous rights and thinking about land and corporate accountability, thinking about um, you know, ways in which extractive companies can be held accountable, even though they're private actors. Some of the jurisprudence is fundamental and comes from the inter-American system. And it's been sort of, you know, lauded and, and borrowed in other areas, um, in other regional systems. And I think that the African system, while it's a newer system, it is extremely innovative in its uh, appreciation for reproductive rights and justice, in its thinking about collective rights where you know, our human rights project is largely about individualized rights, but the African system explicitly um, thinks about collective rights and responsibilities as well. And so I, I agree, we have to be engaging and utilizing these regional systems. We don't have a system in the Asia Pacific region. That's something to consider and think about. Why don't we? Um, how could we think about a regional system that would protect and promote human rights uh, and advance, advance justice for, for all? But I think the regional systems are very good at uh, localizing, regionalizing justice and accountability for a lot of human rights violations and atrocities. And Matias, I think you wanted to come in here as well. Yeah, to say that uh, also the ICC owes actually a lot to the regional human rights systems. Uh, we've uh, had uh, extensive uh, reference to the inter-American inter courts jurisprudence on, on reparations, for instance, the reparations principles. Uh, but also on the whole, I think, uh, I mean, the, the regional human rights systems and courts have really been kind of trailblazers in many ways in 
paving the way for an uh, international uh, uh, or intergovernmental, well, it's not just in, intergovernmental, it's an international justice system where, where you have international institutions that uh, are, are in, play a big role in ensuring the enjoyment of, of certain rights and upholding certain norms. And uh, I can't help but, you know, indeed uh, pick up on that point that A Asia, the Asia Pacific region does not have a regional human rights system. And that is also the region where we have by far the lowest participation in the Rome statute system. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, and again, I think the proposal for a World Court of Human Rights that would have universal jurisdiction to pick up those areas that are not embraced by one of the regional systems has been put um, in the Q&A. Um, on the, did you want to come in on that, Akila? Sorry, I thought no, I saw you. Okay. Um, um, on the question of, of the pact for the future um, and um, what it contains or should contain, would anyone like to address that? I can speak a little bit as well. I'm happy to talk about double standards, perhaps, Please. rather than <laughs> I, 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 I'm saying I'm, I am not <laughs> as engaged in the negotiations on the pact for the future. But I mean, I do think that one thing that some international justice avenues offer is an ability to append some upend some of the double standards questions. Right. The the fact that at the International Court of Justice, we've seen Gambia take a case forward. Right. We've seen South Africa take a case forward that goes very directly against, I think, a lot of the Western interests. And, you know, Jen's work on why the Security Council is such a problem in this conversation illustrates why I think we need some of these more creative avenues, right? We also saw with the, you know, the recent International Court of Justice advisory opinion on the occupation in Palestine, we saw that that not only exposed a situation, but just yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, it actually enabled the General Assembly to pass a resolution that really clearly calls for steps that, you know, could not be called for through the Security Council, right? And it helped to build through that consensus. And so I think that seeing how understanding these tools is something that is for any state to use, and it's not just meant to be a tool that's used by Western states against, you know, other countries, I think is a way to help upend a little bit of this conversation. I think we have a lot more to unpack. And I think certainly as well, looking at, you know, the ICC, I feel like all the situations I've worked on that are related to the ICC are the ones that, are, you know, the populations I work with are like, where's the action, right? And places like Myanmar and places like Afghanistan, where there have been really longstanding investigations and absolutely no action. Um, I think it's also important to be thinking about what are the reasons for those and how is it that, you know, action in those can also help to, you know, you know, if the ICC were to say, let's prioritize some of these other situations, perhaps that could also help to see the universality of the ICC and the fact that perhaps they're not just operating on double standards as to who they'll go after or which investigations they will open up and act. Um, and I'll just note that the word court did not appear in the zero draft. Um, and uh, now in revision five, which has been um, to, to call it a contested negotiation, I think would be a massive understatement, um, but which is hot off the presses um, as of yesterday. Um, there is the obligation for states to comply with the decisions of the International Court of Justice. As we mentioned, one of the core crimes of the ICC does not make it into the, uh, the pact for the future. Um, I think as was alluded to um, a, a few uh, occasions, there's a people's pact for the future that civil society has developed that um, hopes to be a companion piece and an advocacy tool um, to address some of these shortcomings, perhaps, of the Pact for the Future. I think my colleagues um, have or will put that into the chat um, where we look at some of these issues. Um, there was a question in the chat um, about um, marginalized and minority populations participate in international courts and tribunals. We've talked a little bit about gender and we talked a little bit about the regional court system, um, uh, particularly the inter-American system um, being innovative in its um, uh, addressing and bringing to the table uh, the concerns of minority populations. I don't think we have time that we could have a separate webinar on that. And I would really be interested to probe more uh, uh, deeply. We're gonna take one more question from the room and then we're a little bit over time already. Um, thanks to the generosity of our host, we I think have a couple extra minutes. So Anna, over to you and then just one quick round of closing. Thank you so much. This uh, seminar was really, really great. 
I'm Anna Maralaswink and I work for the Global Challenges Foundation. And I actually have three questions, but they are hopefully not, not uh, too big to tackle. The first one is, if the language on the international courts that is currently in the um, fifth tradition of the past stays, could there be potential to build on that and take that forward? Are the actions useful yeah. for further advocacy yeah. efforts? That's the first one. The second one relates more to the court's relationship with the wider global peace and security architecture and whether you see potential for further action by, for instance, the General Assembly, but potentially also other parts of the architecture to really help strengthen the role of the courts. And the third one was just out of curiosity, why are the G7 states um, blocking the idea of a special tribunal for, for Russia? Thanks. I think this is actually a perfect setup for a round of closing remarks. Um, the, the last question might be um, the first to answer, um, I, I think. And then the other two, I think, are quite forward looking in terms of um, the advocacy, taking the pact forward and taking this whole summit of the future process forward on the one hand and looking at international courts and tribunals. Um, um, not as siloed from, but part of a peace and security architecture. Um, so I'll go to Jennifer maybe first, um, and uh, we can get that, that last question out of the way. And then maybe we'll do a round. Uh, Jocelyn Akila Matias, does that sound good to everybody? Okay. So on your question, why would the G7 um, be proposed, first block an international tribunal, our best mechanism for, for approaching this, and then still in the core group negotiations saying there should be immunity for top level leaders. When on the crime of aggression, it is top level leaders who decide to go to war. So it's particularly the leadership that should be addressed by the crime of aggression. Um, I don't think they've gone on record saying this, but my suspicion is they do not want to set the precedent of trying a high level head of state should one of their high level heads of state someday decide to go to war. Um, and the crime of aggression is pretty conservative. You need a manifest charter violation. So you need quite a strong case. And I think all countries should be willing to say, we will not violate the UN charter in quite a strong case. So I don't, you know, so I think this is what is at issue. And they're thinking, you know, 20 years from now, will we have a Gulf War II invasion of Iraq repeat? And they're leery of the precedent they could create. But if you are leery of the precedent, then you give Putin impunity for this crime. And you are giving other future leaders impunity. And very quickly, in closing, what else could the GA do? Um, I have my documents. They are also on challenging unlimited veto power. So it is a question of if genocide's occurring and there's a plan to stop it before the Security Council and it's vetoed, well, isn't that enabling the genocide? And we need to look at it from a legal perspective, the obligations of the international legal system related to use Kogan's norms, related to the UN Charter, related to the prevention of genocide. We can see this in some of the Syria vetoes. Um, Russia is essentially enabling chemical weapons use. Mm -hmm. They're blocking all these resolutions. Is that okay under the legal system? So this is what I'm pushing. Please pick up a handout um, and stay tuned October 8 for our film on this launching at International Peace Institute. And uh, if we don't have the link to that, we'll send the link to that out to everybody. Um, I, I will also mention that at least Security Council reform is on the table in the pact, back to Emma's question. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think right now the conversations are mostly about expansion or who the new permanent member should be. Um, and strides have been taken. Please look at Jennifer's work with regards to the veto. Jocelyn, over to you. Yeah, I guess what I was thinking in closing, to close, was um, actually thinking about some of the work that I'm doing with the Lenape, who are the original people of Manahata'an, which is the island of Manhattan. And when the October 7th atrocities occurred and the response in Gaza occurred, their statement on what was happening was so incredible. It, it spoke about the children and it spoke about 
the damage to Mother Earth. And it focused on the future. These are the two things that we all as societies must care about. We need to care about our future generations and we need to care about the earth that if we don't sustain, we all are not going to be able to continue. And that's what I keep coming back to with the things like these consensus documents. They're just a piece of paper unless we all can get behind them with strategies, with tactics, with coalitions, with solidarity, building support across and among states' parties and cross regionally, right? We cannot do this. These, these big ideas are just that, ideas, unless we build these coalitions. And these are the types of consensus documents that can get us to the coalitions and that can get us moving forward. And so, yeah, I think it's the perfect way to do that. We have to dream, dream big or else, you know, we're failing the next generation. And as one of the uh, special rapporteurs, former special rapporteurs said, we'll all just be running to the pe precipice in fur coats, taking selfies. <laughs> <laughs> and towards coalition building, um, of course, um, about 15 organizations got together in the, the 1990s, now 2,300 some odd uh, that is the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. We are just a humble coalition, an impact coalition for just institutions and the International Cor uh, Court of Justice, shortly to be retitled, um, but we hope that you will join and I think the links are in the chat. Akila, your final word. Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's been so much to kind of dig into and think about in this conversation. I will say, going back to my original intervention, I think something that is very much on the table at this UN General Assembly that has not been paid much attention to is the Crimes Against Humanity Treaty for folks to think about how they can engage with their states to make sure that they're actually supporting this process, right? That they're meaningfully engaging in it because it offers, you know, sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity. What, you know, we haven't had an opportunity to think about negotiating a treaty like this in a really long time. And I think what it does is it also forces us to think about how we expand the scope of who we think are appropriate stakeholders in this conversation. Lawyers are the absolute worst. I'm a lawyer, right? <laughs> and the lawyers think that only lawyers should be at the table when it comes to developing and identifying what these things are. So how do we bring diverse perspectives? How do we bring survivors and victims to the table and give them a meaningful role in actually negotiating and saying what the law should say? Because the lawyers haven't always gotten it right. Um, and I so and I think that that is the other thing we need to think about consistently across all of these different things is who has access? What are we all doing to make sure that we are expanding the scope of who is able to participate in any of these conversations? Because that's what's actually going to give us the legitimacy moving forward, right? So many of the failures of the multilateral architecture come from the fact that it was created by a very small group of elite states who said this is what our architecture for international governance should look like, right? And the failings are coming out of that. And so I think for all of us to think about who's at the table, who's leading the conversations and to question our, ourselves, right? Even sometimes I'm like, yeah, but, you know, when I, you know, I work with a lot of, um, you know, women's rights communities and they know so much and they identify things that us lawyers with our very narrow-minded viewpoints on how we look at something um, you know, they're able to actually really look at something and say what's actually missing that we don't see because our perspective can sometimes be limited. So I think it's a challenge to all of us as well to get outside of our own comfort zones as we think about how we engage in the uh, And let us not forget that when the charter was negotiated, it was 50 states and I think four women were present at uh, the Charter yeah. Review Conference. <laughs> Um, and for those of you who are in town for the Summit of the Future Week um, and who represent civil society um, uh, or various sectors that are not member states, uh, you have been through the apparata, the multiple registration processes, all the barriers to entry to get in the door, get a seat at the table, get in the room where it happens. Um, Matthias, I would love to give you the final word, my friend. Thank you very much. I, I have three short points to make. First point is that I'm proud to work in a court which already for the second time in, in its history has a majority of uh, women, female judges uh, on its bench, uh, outnumbering men 11 to 7. 
which should be completely normal, but indeed has been mentioned that this has not been in any way the norm in the history of international law. So I'm I'm proud that the ICC is a is a is a pioneer uh, in in that respect. Second point I want to make uh, very quickly on consulting victims. Uh, I spoke earlier about the reparations orders uh, in Ongwen and Daganda cases, and for instance, in Ongwen uh, the Trust Fund for Victims has just submitted the draft implementation plan to the chamber. And it is a result of extensive consultations with victims. Uh, and, and so they really the, the intention, the effort there is to design reparations that are based on the wishes of the victims themselves and not just impose something from above, something from the outside, say, oh, let's give money, let's do this. So really the whole design of the repression is based on an extensive consultation and the wishes of the victims themselves to make them as relevant and as meaningful as possible. And the last point is on the, uh, what is that document called again? The Pact, Pact for the Future. Uh, so if revision five, if the text I've seen is, the, is going to be the final text, Look, if the obligations under Action 14 uh, are, are truly upheld, that would be amazing. I mean, I think it would be revolutionary. So I can only hope that it won't be only, you know, uh, words on paper. So if states really uh, will do what they say they, they intend to do or, or what they, the commitment they're making, going to make, uh, you know, that would be amazing. So the real challenge is to, I suppose, to hold uh, states to their, to their promises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. And um, I, I think we've all been hearing the murmurs, many of us have been hearing the murmurs about an accountability mechanism that civil society would like to work with states um, to propose uh, to keep those words, not only on paper, but actionable. It remains for me to thank all of you for being with us today, most especially, of course, our panelists. I also need to thank my team behind the scenes at Citizens for Global Solutions, Dre Klein Bergman, uh, James May, and Hannah Fields, our partners, WFM IGP, hi, Alan, um, and hi, John Blasto in the room, and World Future Council, and most, most, most of all, um, the Open Society Foundations for giving us this beautiful space and um, all the technology. Thank you for bearing through some technical uh, troubles online, um, but we are delighted to have this communication and hope it will be getting the beginning of many conversations with OSJI and all these wonderful partners around the table. Thank you, and I'll conclude the meeting there.